House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery, and I'm Al Warren. And co-hosting today, we've got Mr. David Martino. I am um, here. Yeah, you were there. And I'm just there barely. Present. Thanks, Al. <laughs> <laughs> just barely, that's true. Just, just barely. And anytime anybody wants to keep, get some good recipes, we're using a pressure cooker. <laughs> Dave is the one for you. He, he I'll show you how to blow it up. Yeah, he not only knows how, <laughs> how, how to drink scotch properly, he knows how that's to... True. Uh, do Instapots, you know. <laughs> yeah. So send your emails to him. I will not answer. Um, well, now today we are um, going into, uh, we have another writer, and we've got a lot of um, uh, interest in, in, in her. And, of course, in uh, the f- fantasy sort of um, and science fiction and all those sort of genres are doing really, really well. So let's uh, welcome Mercedes Lackey to the show. How are you doing, Mercedes? I am doing about as well as can be expected in the midst of a plague. <laughs> I guess that's good. It's okay. It's, I, who knows? Um, wow. So you've got a lot of books out now. It says here you've done over 50 novels. Um, uh, that's a severe understatement. 145. So where did the write bug come for, for it? Like, where did it start for you? Because that's a lot of writing. Well, first of all, um, I put out between three and five every year. So over the course of 35 years in the publishing business, that's where you get 145 books. Actually, I have always written. I wrote when I was a kid. I wrote for the local grade school literary magazine. That's basically where the writing bug came from. I always had it. What got you into the this type of writing? What, what kind of writer would you consider yourself then? Certainly not a literary writer. I have no literary pretensions. I guess I would just call myself a storyteller. So what kind of stories do you like to tell people? Is, 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 I'm trying to get at, like, a lot of these stories, is there some sort of personal aspect to each one of these stories that you write, or is it completely out of the blue? Oh, I suppose... A uh, writer puts a little bit of themselves into everything they write, so to a, to a certain extent, it has to be a personal story. It's not a personal story as in every single novel has got some trauma that befell me in it because it isn't. I just try and write, do write entertaining things. So when you do a book... Um and you put it out, you're, you're just hoping for entertainment value out of it. You're not looking to um, get any points across or anything, um, or are you? Yes and no. Uh, there's going to be some of that in every book, but I'm not writing it. I don't, as as uh, as was once said of, of uh, Ayn Rand, I'm, I, she sold her birthright for a pot of message. I don't do that. There's two newer books out or uh, that you've just had out or I've got on a promotion basis. So Briarheart, um, maybe maybe tell the listeners what they can expect out of Briarheart. What kind of story is that? Briarheart's definitely a younger YA book. Although, as Stephen Colbert says, YA books are the books that people actually read. It sort of starts with the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty and takes a a hard 180. The uh, princess, the baby princess at the beginning of the book that would normally have gotten cursed is saved by her older sister, who is not a princess because her mother was married to someone before she married the king. And this young lady, uh, Miriam, decides that she's going to devote her life to taking to making sure her she, her baby sister is protected. How long does this this kind of book take you to put together? It's such a an elaborate story. A uh, book takes me between uh usually 3 to 4 months, but some can have have, can, can take longer and have taken longer due to circumstances often beyond my control. But in general, it takes me about three to four months to write a book. 
And once I wrote one in one month. It, so it's your process. Does, does the idea just come to you and you sit down and just go at her? Or um, how, how is that process done? Do you do kind of like a nine to five every day or is it just all over? It's, a, it's my job. I make a living doing this, which is something that 90% of other writers cannot do. Um, and I treat it as a job. I work every single day. Uh, I put in at least six to eight hours, usually more. Well, I was wondering um, why, uh, you know, what, what uh, inspired you to uh, retell uh, Sleeping, uh, Sleeping Beauty? Oh, I'd rather like fairy, retelling fairy tales. I've got, I've got an entire series based on that. The Elemental Master series is retold fairy tales at the turn of the century. It starts in the period I cover is starts in the late 1880s and goes to about World War One. It's just something I enjoy doing is to to retell fairy tales. Change the ending. Ah, <laughs> uh, change the ending, change the middle. Uh, lots and lots of stuff. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it's the only type of book people read, uh, young adult. Yay! So what? What do you think? Why do you think that is? Or what? Well, exactly. I'm, I, didn't, I didn't say that, Stephen no, Colbert did. No, Stephen Colbert, but you mentioned it, so I wonder if, do you think that's true? And do you, it, What do you think it is about YA that gets people reading it? I think it's because the writers of YA are mostly invested in telling the story and not, not, not preaching, and I think people are looking for escapism, and people who write YA books are... Not afraid of escapism. It's interesting. What what do people get out of YA? Like, you know, if you were to explain, there's so many different categories nowadays with books and stuff. So for, for non-writers, to explain YA, what is YA? YA is young adult, and books usually cover ages from about 14 or 15 to about 18. They are in every genre that I know of. They generally run between 80 and 120,000 words long, whereas an adult book can become a coffee table. Now, you've also got another one that you were talking about, Reboots, Undead Can Dance. Um, tell us about that book. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> that's science fiction. That's written with my one of my co-writers, Cody Martin. It came out of a what I initially thought was really stupid short story collection proposal that uh, an acquaintance of mine pitched at me of vampires, werewolves, and zombies in space. And I thought I had never heard of anything so stupid in my life, and I was kind of ranting to Cody about it. And basically saying, I've never heard of anything so stupid in my life. How could you possibly? And I just paused right there because I thought of a reason why you would have vampires, werewolves, and zombies in space. It's uh, a little bit, it's a lot space opera, uh, a healthy heaping of detective noir, and... Just a tiny bit of of horror, but not much because our 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 protagonists are not very are not very scary. <laughs> uh, and the reason you would have zombies, vampires, and werewolves in space is because the in in the backstory of this, which we don't go into very very much at all. One of the zombies, all these creatures have existed in hiding all these years until one of the zombies got intelligence, made himself the king of the zombies, and decided to start a zombie apocalypse, which did not end well for him. But the werewolves and the vampires and the other critters decided rather grudgingly to come in up to the war on the side of, of human beings at least in part because they were protecting their food source. And then, of course, once humans realized they 
existed, they struck back with all the ingenuity of humans and gra gradually uh, a truce was struck, which ended up with the supernatural creatures very much on the short end of the stick. When practical space travel, uh, sublight travel, was instituted, these things were rattle traps. They were prone to leak. Uh, they were built by the highest bidder or by the lowest bidder. And who better to cat crew these things than supernatural creatures that are tougher than humans and sometimes don't have to don't don't even need air <laughs> and are impervious to radiation. So the zombies go along as uh, disposable janitors. The werewolves tend to go along as crew, and the vampires, of course, because they think they are lords of the universe, are the upper-level crew in captaincy. And the book starts on one of these highly dysfunctional ships, right at the point where everybody is... Uh, gathered around the sole werewolf engineer to drain his blood for dinner. They don't drain it completely, obviously, <laughs> but he's, he's their food supply. When you, when you bring uh, things like werewolves, vampires, and, and zombies into your story like this, um, what kind of rules do you give them? Do you give them your own rules, or do you just follow the standard kind of rules that have been given, you know, like, vampires with the sun or the uh, cross and uh, you know all the typical ones we hear about constantly do you do you stick to those with with your with your beings or do you like to make your own oh i i we we stuck with the tropes on this because it's really more funny it's, and this is a humorous book i mean it's detective noir but it's but it's 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 a funny book and it's a lot easier to to do the jokes if you've got the tropes. If everybody agrees, if everybody agrees what the tropes are, then you've got the background for the for the jokes. Right, right. Because then they won't be concentrating on that. Um, I, I wonder. So, when you work with a co-writer, do you guys like sit down together and plan it all out, or do you just each write certain sections? How does that work? Well, lately, it's generally been that uh, we get together and use uh, Google Docs for the shared writing. We're actually in the same document at the same time and discussing it off on, discussing it off to the side. And that works really well because we've got a superhero series that's got four of us in it at once. And that works, that tends to work way better than some then dividing it up and deciding, oh, you write this and you write this and you write this. We end up bouncing ideas off each other and coming up with much better prose than we could if we were, had divided it up that way. And now you've got a new one coming out. You've got a, um, I, I would say, now, what are you working on now? But it looks like you've just got a new one coming out here for um, um, ju just in January. So less than a month away. Tell us about that. That's the Silver Bullets of Annie Oakley. That is my Elemental Master series, which takes place between about 1880 and roughly the begin beginning first couple of years of World War I. Most of them are set in the UK and Europe, but not all of them. And it posits the world and history we know, but with magic in it. And the magic system I have is that there are people who can control elementals of the of the four element for five elements: uh, air, fire, water, earth, and spirit. And I've got geez, at least a dozen of these things. And this one is the first time I've actually used a historical character. Uh, I used Annie Oakley, and she turns out to be an elemental master, and she's also a werewolf hunter.
Well, that goes together. Uh, how, how much of the original character and their features do you use in a book like this? I was very careful to heavily research Annie and, and her husband, Frank. Uh, normally, I research the period. This time, I was researching the, the, the actual uh, people and Annie and Frank and Buffalo Bill and pretty much I think I got her accurate. I think I got her I think I got her pretty accurate. But I had piles of Annie Oakley books next to me for a while. Well, I was wondering too with the uh, the elementals, um what are those exactly? Are they spirits or uh, how do you how do you portray them within the book? I portray them as being the personification of the element itself in the form of supernatural creatures from Mm. folklore. So the elementals of air, which are Annie's, for instance, start with the little tiny sylphs that look like the Victorian fairies and go all the way up to the the great Greek tempests, uh, the elementals of fire, for instance, start with salamanders and end with dragons. So kind of how they're traditionally uh, portrayed. Uh, yeah, except that I've co-opted a lot of things like brownies and kobolds and things like that that are not normally considered to be elemental creatures. What, what makes you choose someone like Annie Oakley? Of all the characters in history, is there something special about Annie Oakley? Oh, this was, it was pure serendipity. Uh, A game writer of ours, Owen K. Stevens, game writer friend of ours, uh, Owen K. Stevens, was on Facebook asking what people wanted, thought would be a good title for a steampunk wild weird west game campaign and one of the ones that he threw out there was the silver bullets of Anna Oakley and I went oh my <laughs> <laughs> I think he I think for his game he ended up going with something else but I seized on that in no time flat. I could just see the, I could just see the pick, the plot unrolling before me. I, I wonder. So when you've got, it says you've got sixteen. This is book sixteen of the Elemental Masters. Each book's. It may be more. It may be more than that. I don't remember. Oh, uh, but t- does each book stand alone? You don't have to read. Most of them stand alone. Some have overlapping characters, and there's a handful that are centered around two characters that I first wrote about in a short story, Elemental Master short story, and combined them with Dr. Watson from the Sherlock Holmes series because Dr. Watson in my Elemental Master's continuity is himself an Elemental Master, so is his wife Mary. And they take on the weird cases that Sherlock Holmes refuses to take. The first one, the first one of those is a study in Sable, I believe. Do you have kind of a point with when you do these sort of books? Is it just entertainment again, or is there something more to it? Well, I mean, there's always uh, something more to it. I just uh, entertainment just comes first. We're all political creatures, and that that's going to come out no matter what. Um, so now, you you have a flock of parrots. Uh. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can hear them. No, that's all right. So that's that's interesting. I you, you it says here you're a wild bird rehabilitator. I was so actually we got you were we got too old to climb into trees and wade through fifty million miles of wait a minute bushes. Uh, <laughs> And about the time when we felt that we were getting a little too old to do this, I mean, I'm 71, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. About the time we figured we were getting a little too old to do this, 
someone put in a really good uh, 501c charitable rehab organization that's just five miles from us. So we said they don't need us anymore. <laughs> but yeah, what what we were what we were doing was uh, birds of prey because most of the rehabbers around here wouldn't take birds of prey. So we took everything from little bitty screech owls to gigantic great blue herons, which are not not known as birds of prey, but they're every bit as dangerous as the as the great horned owls and and the bigger hawks. So we got them, and no, because nobody else wanted to handle them. Yeah. That and fish poop. Well, that's, <laughs> well, that's a good thing, right? It's it, that in itself is uh, rewarding. It was. It was. It was fabulous, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, there's something extremely rewarding about getting an animal in that is probably going to die in the wild and giving it the space and the food and whatever minimal care it needs to heal and then turning it loose again. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. That's, that's good work. Um, do you have a website and a place that you want people to come find you, or do you like social media? www.mercedeslackey.com. Well, that's easy. Yep. Um, and of course, we'll put that up on our website. So that's fantastic. So, um, wow. So I guess you, how do you keep track of all this when you've got so many books going in your mind? Um, oh, I work from an outline. I'm a, yeah. I'm not an, I'm not a, a seat of the pants writer. I, I create an extensive outline first and I work out all the problems that are going to happen in the, in the book out in the outline form, and then I can just sit down and write because I know exactly where the book is going and I know exactly where it's been. That's an interesting. That's, um, that, that, you know, it's a good process. That, and so your characters, where, where do your characters come from, their personality or traits? Does that, is that just all imaginary, or do you, are you one of those writers that has a relationship with their characters? Oh, gosh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of uh they do occasionally and when when i say that the character goes someplace that i hadn't intended what that actually means is that a writer's subconscious is way more savvy about plotting and characterization than your conscious mind is and the characters, quote, talking to you, that's just your subconscious mind saying, no, now you set this character up to be this kind of a person. They are not going to do that unless you give them a better excuse than you've got in that outline. Uh, and that, that's all it is. Uh, it's, it's tapping into your subconscious. Your subconscious knows all that stuff about the, uh, the, Everything from tropes to classic Greek drama construction, your subconscious actually knows all that. Even if, you're, even if you've never read anything about how to write, your subconscious has been taking in story from the time you were a little kid. And it knows what makes the brain satisfied with the story. And... If you're in touch with your subconscious on this, you're going to create stories that are going to satisfy other people. Well, I was wondering, um, you're talking about uh, parrots, birds of prey. Have you um, ha have they ended up in your stories? Oh, gosh, uh, have you yes. had any other hobbies or anything oh, else? Oh, gosh, like that? yes. So well, uh, the, the Nan and Sarah story, Elemental Master Books. Uh, have a African gray parrot and a raven. Hmm. And we've put the birds of prey in a, in my Valdemar series with the, with the Hawk brothers. And yeah, they definitely end up in there. Actually, I had a series of, of 
I think it was four books called the Joust series that kind of combined ancient Egypt and dragons. And all of the dragon behavior was based on bird of prey behavior. I've got a degree in biology, so that comes into it too. I imagine, yeah, it all it all gets into there and stuff. Hey, you know, does, so when when things are stressful, like you know, when you were talking about, you brought up the pandemic right away, or the you know, does that affect your writing? You know, outside outside of things it does. like that, does that sort of make you absolutely? It does, eh? Do you think that um, when you write during those times or when things are stressful, the story would become a little darker or a little bit more? Uh, actually, the I opposite. Know. I'm trying to write things that are not dark, both for my own mental health and because I'm pretty sure people don't want to read dark stuff right now. Kind of an escape, in a sense, kind of a... Well, I'm an unashamed escapist. <laughs> Escape is good for you. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. Um, it, 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 what what book would you suggest to people of yours if they've never read a book of yours yet, and you, and you want them to read something? Uh, which one would you suggest? It really depends upon what they normally like. If what you like is Classic fantasy, you know, medievalish period kind of stuff. Uh, my Valdemar series, which is huge, it's like 40 books now. Uh, there are, you can either read them chronologically as I, as I put them in the timeline. You can read them in the order that I wrote them. Or you can start with Arrows of the Queen, or Foundation, or Black Griffin. Those are three starting points for the whole series. Because after you get to have about 40 books in a series, you need to give people a new reentry point to it. Uh, if you like steampunkish type stuff, then definitely the Elemental Masters series, and you could just pick up anything including Annie Oakley. Uh, if you're looking at epic f fantasy, Cast of Thousands, games of the Game of Thrones type thing, then the Obsidian Mountains series is the place to go. Uh, if you just want a good laugh, pick up Undead Can Dance, because it's it pretty much has 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 charmed and delighted every single reviewer that's looked at it. Um, then we've I've got urban fantasy. I've got uh, a good place to start with my urban fantasy is probably a night of ghosts and shadows, or from circle, or. The reboot, which is Silence. I've got a superhero series for crying out loud. It's called The Secret World Chronicles. <laughs> and you start start that one with uh, Invasion. I've got a couple of science fiction books, not many. I mean, Undead Can Dance is kind of science fiction. Uh, I've got a book I wrote with Anne McCaffrey, which is science fiction in the Brain Ship series. So, I mean, it really just depends where people want to start. Um, I've also got another young adults trilogy that is uh, post-apocalypse with magic called the Hunter Trilogy. The first book of that is Hunter, so there's that. Uh, when you when you've got when you've got as many books as I do, you've got something for everyone. One hopes. Mm. You know, um, do you still have um, influences and writers that that you read to this day, even after all those books are done that you've done? Uh, do, do you still have oh, some that God, you still yes. love to to read and and that kind of inspire you still now? Oh God, yes. Uh, well. 
I'm more slow, steadily working my way through the complete works of uh, Theodore Sturgeon, because while he was still around, I certainly didn't see everything that he wrote, and I'm having a blast of m making my way through the uh, the 13 volumes of his work. Uh, Charles DeLint is just a chef's kiss. Uh, if I could write as well as he does on his worst day, on my best day, I'd be very happy. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more, but yes, I certainly do. What, what advice would you give to someone that's um, a new writer, someone that's writing and they're, they, they want to be published, they want to get out there? What, what do you say with these nowadays? What would you say to them? Well, the first draft of your first book is going to be crap. Every first draft of every book ever written was crap. And I don't care if you, you, you can fling the Jack Kerouac at me. It's a lie. He revised his book. It wasn't, he didn't turn in the, the giant single scroll of paper that he allegedly wrote on the typewriter in a white hot heat. He revised it a bunch of times first. So when you finish your first book and you think you're finished, you're not finished. You're going to have to revise that thing and revise that thing, and it would do you a lot of good to get a second pair of eyes on it, a second good critical pair of eyes on it. And basically, you have to write about a million words of crap before you're going to get anything that's publishable. And once you accept that and embrace it, it's actually kind of freeing because you've got Lots of room to make lots of, of experiments with your work. And you know that mistakes are not irrevocable. It's not set in stone. It's not even cast in concrete. It's written in sand, and you can rewrite it. Yeah. Do you, do you like the way social media is now and the way people are all over the place, and, and that is, is it sort of a good thing, do you think? I think social media is poison. <laughs> well, it's certainly a lot. They really it's certainly do. brought out a lot of negativity, that's for sure. It's hard to deal with sometimes, but, um, yeah. But p p perhaps people will get better with it over time. I wish I had your <laughs> optimism. It's not really optimism, because I see... Um, I, you know, we get tons of stuff through um, the Internet that people are not always the best or the nicest. But I'm just hoping that, is, that, that a lot of the good ones just don't do it. A lot of them just stay out of it. So, yeah. Well, I know it's gotten so toxic that there are a lot of writers that have completely dropped out of social media now. And I mostly do not engage in it. Um, my husband has a Twitter account and he's the forward facing person for us in social media. And for the most part, I mean, I've got a Facebook, I've got a Twitter, he's got his Twitter, but for the most part, he's the one that handles it and I don't know what's going on on my own Facebook account, and I don't <laughs> care. They'll ask me that every so often. Someone will, someone who does the takes care of the Facebook or the Twitter for me, asks me some some questions, and I answer them. And it goes up, apparently goes off into the ether and becomes little pixels on people's screens, and I don't care. Yeah, it's probably better that way, you know. So it's kind of its own little world, and I don't know how much it really means anyway. So, Don't know, don't care. <laughs> so, so there you go. Uh, you plan on writing for many more years to come, or are you ever going to retire? I'm going to write until I drop dead. Well, <laughs> that says it. Which hopefully, it. Will, which hopefully will be a long time from now. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta hope. 
We uh, so, we finally yeah. got our uh, first nipple on uh, on a media deal. Wow! Yeah, radar radar pictures picked up the first three of the Von Hill books in the in the uh, Valdemar series, and they're going to start pitching them after the first of the year to oh. networks. That's excellent news. That's great. Fantastic. Well, let's let's hope it goes somewhere. Yeah, it would be nice. It'd be nice to see it actually uh, produced and stuff like that. That'd be fantastic for you. It would be lovely. Well, uh, Mercedes, we're at the end of our time, and we really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. I'm sorry that we ended up with uh, birds screaming in the background, and <laughs> we love birds, and we love all animals. Well, so I have a dozen okay. parrots, so. It's unusual when it's quiet. Listen, we've had best-selling writers take their dogs for a walk while they interview with us, so that's okay. All right. You know, we love animals. So, again, it's been a pleasure. Um, Our guest has been Mercedes Lackey. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed being had. Thanks, Mercedes. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.